Now in our 21st year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1135 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Dayton Hamvention announces its 2021 theme. The Hamvention will be called The Gathering. The ARRL Director and Vice Director election results have been announced, as well as the election results for the New York City Long Island Section Managers. We will have all the winners. A long-standing amateur radio icon, Universal Radio, has announced it is closing its doors. We will have all the details. The U.S. Coast Guard is proposing to discontinue HF Communications watchkeeping. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is seeking reserve telecommunications operators and there is still time to apply for openings at the U.S. Foreign Service as they are looking for radio technician specialists. We will have an update on the ARRL response to the FCC asking the agency to allow amateur operations in the 3.4 GHz band to continue until the spectrum is otherwise occupied. Students in Iowa tracked their school's balloon launch as it circumnavigated the planet. And we will have the story of how one young amateur radio operator's contact spurred on not only a great career, but a long trip to the very bottom of the planet. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will get us up to speed by demystifying the alphabet soup regarding the purchasing of a new TV or monitor for your shack. Australia's own Anno Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, will tell us why one whisper receiver just isn't enough. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill covers the years 1912 to 1915 and will talk about Edwin Armstrong and World War I. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about how to correctly support your coax on the run up your tower. This and a whole lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in the broadcast capital of the world, this is N2WWW in Schenectady, New York. Reporting from our news bureau in historic Troy, New York, home of Uncle Sam Wilson, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from our foggy and rainy yet mild outpost, Atop the Catskill Mountains in western New York, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where the weather's gotten a tad colder, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, Will Rogers, K5WLR, still plugging along. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news, the gathering will be the theme for the 2021 Dayton Hamvention. Hamvention General Chair Rick Allnut, WSAG, said, The theme reflects what has been missing from our lives most of this year. We have spent the last six months being bound to our houses in small groups, he said. We are very optimistic that when May arrives, we will be allowed to get together. Allnut, a medical director with a master's degree in public health, said Hamvention management is closely following the coronavirus situation and believes it will improve enough by May that government restrictions on travel and large groups will be relaxed. The Hamvention team will continue to follow developments. We hope we will all be able to get together, talk about ham radio, and share the interaction we have missed, Allnut said. The gathering theme acknowledges the role that Hamvention plays in amateur radio. Hamvention 2021 will be held May 21st to the 23rd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. 
The ARRL Dakota Division will have a new director and the Great Lakes and Midwest Divisions will have new vice directors on January 1st. The results of four contested elections for director and vice director in three ARRL divisions were announced on November 20th after ballots were tallied at ARRL headquarters. In the Dakota Division, incumbent Matt Holden, K0BBC, lost his re-election bid to challenger Vernon Bill Lippert, AC0W. The vote was 982 to 485. Holden had served as director since 2016. In the Great Lakes Division, incumbent director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, retained his seat in a challenge from Michael Calter, W8CI. The vote was 1,840 to 1,398. In a three-way contest for Great Lakes Division Vice Director, Ohio Section Manager Scott Yonnelly, N8SY, received 1,670 votes to outpoll Jim Hessler, K8JH, with 975 votes, and Frank Piper, KI8GW, who received 611 votes. Incumbent Vice Director Tom Delaney, W8WTD, did not run for another term. In the Midwest Division, Dave Proper, K2DP, will become the new Vice Director in January. He received 1,164 votes to 623 votes for challenger Lloyd Colston, KC5FM. Current Vice Director Art Ziegelbaum, K0AIZ, will become the new Director in January. He was unopposed to succeed incumbent director Rod Bloxham, K0DAS, who did not seek a new term. The following were declared elected without opposition. In the Atlantic Division, director Tom Abernethy, W3TOM, who has held the seat since 2013, and vice director Bob Famiglio, K3RF, elected to a three-year term 2015 to 2018 and then appointed in 2019 to fill a vacancy when the incumbent stepped down. In the Dakota Division, Vice Director Lynn Nelson, W0ND, in office since 2018. In the Delta Division, Director David Norris, K5UZ, who served in that office since 2012, and Vice Director Ed Hudgens, WB4RHQ, who appointed in 2013. In the Midwest Division, current Vice Director Art Ziegelbaum, K0AIZ, will become the new director in January, succeeding incumbent Rod Bloxham, K0DAS, who is stepping down. Ziegelbaum has been the Vice Director since 2014. All newly elected officials take office at noon on January 1, 2021. New York City, Long Island Section Manager Jim Mezzi, W2KFV, has been re-elected in the fall election cycle. Mezzi, of Carl Place, received 527 votes to 136 for challenger Donny Katovich, W2BRU. The race for the New York City, Long Island Section Manager was the only contested election. Mezzi begins a new two-year term of office on January 1, 2021. He has served as New York City Long Island Section Manager since 2013. In the West Central Florida section, Michael Douglas, W4MDD of Wachula, Florida, will become Section Manager starting on January 1, 2021. He was the only nominee for the post. Douglas is currently Affiliated Club Coordinator, a Technical Specialist, and an Official Emergency Station. Incumbent West Central Florida Section Manager Daryl Davis, KT4WX, did not run for a new term after serving for the past six years. The following incumbent section managers were the only candidates for re-election and will begin new terms of office on January 1st. Tom Walsh, K1TW in Eastern Massachusetts. Cecil Higgins, ACWHA in Missouri. Matt Anderson, KA0BOJ in Nebraska. Thomas Dick, KF2GC in Northern New York, Mark Tarpley, N4UFP in South Carolina, Tom Pricer, N2XW in Southern New Jersey, and Joe Shupinis, W3BC in Western Pennsylvania. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Ham Radio Retailer, Universal Radio, headquartered in Worthington, Ohio, is closing its store effective November 30th. 
although existing orders will be filled and the Universal Radio website will remain open to sell off remaining stock publications and some select products. Owners Fred Osterman, N8EKU, and Barbara Osterman, KC8VWI, are retiring. I was very fortunate to have been in the radio business for over 50 years, 13 at Radio Shack, and 37 at Universal Radio, Fred Osterman said in a message of gratitude. A report in SWLing Post noted that the couple were big supporters of amateur radio clubs and other nonprofit organizations over the years. The company's website posted a message from the couple, which notes that even though their current location in Worthington, Ohio, is closing on November 30th, the company will fulfill all existing orders and continue to close out its inventory. The company will also maintain its website for the meantime. We have met many wonderful people along the journey who have supported us personally, as well as Universal Radio, they said. It had been a privilege to have a continuous career in the fascinating field of radio since 1969. Universal was founded in 1942 by F.R. Gibb, W8IJ, in downtown Columbus, Ohio, and was known as a specialist in shortwave and amateur equipment, including Millen, Drake, Collins, and Hammerland. Barbara and Fred became the third owners in 1982 after buying Universal from Thomas Harrington, W8OMV, who had acquired it after F.R. Gibb became a silent key. The new mailing address for Universal Radio is 752 North State Street, Unit 222, in Westerville, Ohio. The U.S. Coast Guard has invited comments by January 21, 2021, on a proposal to discontinue HF Voice watchkeeping. The proposal appeared on November 20 in the Federal Register. The U.S. Coast Guard proposes to cease monitoring 4125, 6215, 8291, and 12290 kilohertz in contiguous U.S. and Hawaii due to the lack of activity. We believe this change would have a low impact on the maritime public as commercial satellite radios and digital selective calling marine SSBHF radios have become more prevalent on board vessels, the Coast Guard said. However, we would like your comments on how you would be affected if we terminated monitoring HF voice-only distress frequencies within the contiguous U.S. and Hawaii particularly if you use HF but do not currently have a commercial satellite radio or an HF digital selective calling radio aboard your vessel. The Coast Guard said it would continue to monitor HF digital selective calling, distress alerting for all existing regions and voice distress, and hailing from Kodiak, Alaska, and Guam. The Maritime Mobile Service Net on 14300 MHz remains available to less equipped mariners who need assistance in emergencies. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is seeking telecommunications operator reservists to assist in emergency recovery efforts on an intermittent on-call basis. The deadline to apply is December 8th, but FEMA will not take any applications beyond the first 200, which may come sooner than that. These FEMA reservist positions seem well suited to radio amateurs. Duties include sending, receiving, and distributing HF radio messages between first responders using the phonetic alphabet, Morse code, call signs, continuous wave, and proper frequencies based on network requirements, as well as setting up, establishing, and maintaining an HF radio site in an austere environment and performing site analysis to determine an optimal location. Among other requirements, candidates should have an understanding of radio wave propagation for day, night, and transitional period frequency use, and be able to maintain station message logs and compile communication reports. The Reservist Program is an appointment-type grant under the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, Section 306, Subpart B, which authorizes FEMA to appoint such temporary employees as necessary to accomplish work authorized under the Act. See the position description on the USA Jobs website for complete information. In comments to the FCC, the ARRL has argued that radio amateurs be allowed to continue shared operation in the 3.4 GHz band until 5G licensees who purchase the spectrum when the FCC puts it up for auction initiate incompatible operations. In its further notice of proposed rulemaking in WT Docket 19-348, the FCC had proposed to sunset the band for amateur radio in two phases, governed by when new licensees are issued rather than when the new licensees begin to use the spectrum. 
In the further notice of proposed rulemaking, the FCC solicited comments on whether alternatives exist to its proposal. Amateur activities further the public interest and should be permitted to continue on a secondary basis unless and until a new primary licensee is ready to occupy the spectrum in a preclusive manner, ARRL told the FCC. At a minimum, amateur operations should be permitted to continue indefinitely in the 3.3 to 3.45 GHz spectrum where no new flexible licenses are under immediate consideration. The Commission could consider whether a registration or other mechanism similar to that found in Section 97.303 Subpart G would facilitate avoiding interference. Section 97.303 Subpart G contains specific frequency sharing requirements for the 2200 and 630 meter amateur bands. ARRL said its comments were without prejudice to its pending petition for reconsideration of the FCC proposal to delete the amateur secondary allocation from the entire 3.3 to 3.5 gigahertz band. ARRL noted that some 1,000 comments have been submitted by individual amateurs and amateur organizations at the initial stage of this proceeding. Those included one from the Emergency Communications Coordinator in the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, who wrote, Over the years, the State of California Governor's Office of Emergency Services Public Safety Communications Technical Communications Unit has utilized radio amateur television product during fire operations to gather intel and monitor threats to communications sites being affected by fires and fire weather events. Part of the backbone of the amateur radio television system utilizes the 3 gigahertz spectrum and due to heavy spectrum usage in the 1.2 and 5.8 gigahertz spectrum, the 3 gigahertz spectrum becomes very important for frequency diversity supporting these networks. As ARRL noted, amateurs often select the 3.4 gigahertz spectrum precisely because other spectrum choices are suboptimum or simply not available. Amateurs also are only secondary users on most of the other spectrums suitable for similar purposes, ARRL said. Links must be carefully engineered because of that secondary status, which applies to most of the 2.4 and all of the 5.8 gigahertz bands available to amateurs. In many geographic areas, it is a misconception that the 3.4 gigahertz operations easily can be moved to other bands. ARRL emphasized the importance of allowing amateurs to continue to use the 3.4 to 3.45 gigahertz band in particular. As stated by commenters during the initial stage of this proceeding, some of the equipment commonly used in this band for network linking cannot be rechanneled below 3.4 gigahertz, ARRL said. ARRL pointed out that in many geographic areas, it could be years before the 3 gigahertz spectrum is actually put into use by commercial users and argued that amateur radio should be allowed to continue operations on a secondary non-interference basis as it has done for decades with federal primary users until new uses actually begin rather than when licenses are issued. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Executive Committee approved dues reductions and holidays for member societies in Region 2, which is the Americas. The action came as the Region 2 Executive Committee held its fifth and final virtual meeting of the year on November 18th to complete outstanding business from its three October sessions and to approve the 2021 operating budget. Recognizing that the pandemic created many hardships for member societies and all amateurs in the Americas, the Region 2 Executive Committee approved a one-year dues reduction for 2021. Member societies with annual dues lower than 150 will get a dues holiday next year while larger societies will get a 50% dues reduction. The Region 2 Executive Committee said it's able to allow the discounts because 2021 expenses are expected to be lower, primarily as travel restrictions have moved meeting attendance to being held virtually. The other major item of business was to review the future committee's proposal to the IARU Administrative Council. 
The committee was formed to study and propose how IARU should be structured to become far more nimble and able to respond quickly to changes in the telecommunications ecosystem, the executive committee said. Representing Region 2 at the Executive Committee session were Committee Chair Ramon Santoyo, XE1KK, and Secretary George Gorslain, VE3YV. The meeting concluded with a brief discussion on how much had changed in 2020 while noting that the pandemic had also created new opportunities. For example, the traditional in-person 2022 General Assembly set to be held in Buenos Aires, Argentina, will now be a hybrid event with both in-person and virtual participation, removing the barrier of travel costs for smaller member societies to fully participate, the executive committee said. The very popular Region 2 workshops will be given a reboot in the new year, focusing more on the needs of member societies as well as on emergency communications. The deadline to apply for a U.S. Department of State Foreign Service Information Management Technical Specialist radio position is December 1, 2020. Foreign Service Information Management Technical Specialist Radio Professionals design, install, and maintain radio and telecommunication systems. They provide radio support for presidential, congressional, and other VIP positions. These radio specialists work from a regional location, overseas uh, and domestically. Extensive travel is required to support radio telecommunication system such as land mobile radio, LMR, HF, VHF and UHF radio networks at State Department missions around the world. Potential applicants should read the Foreign Service Specialist Foreign Service page before applying. To begin the online application process, visit position announcement. The deadline to submit completed applications is, as we said, December 1, 2020. Applicants must be U.S. citizens, at least 20 years old to apply, and at least 21 years old to be appointed. Applicants must be available for worldwide service and be able to obtain all required security, medical, and suitability clearances. Email for additional information. With the pandemic restrictions preventing the annual gathering of amateur radio operators on Long Island, New York, the Ham Radio University organizers are adapting the agenda to take place as a virtual conference. Ham Radio University will be held from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on the 9th of January, 2021, as a go-to webinar video conference on the internet. Ham Radio University will also serve as an online convention of the New York City Long Island section of the ARRL. The agenda features 14 presentations from the basics of remote station operation over the internet to software-defined radios, emergency communications, and the nuts and bolts of HF operating. This year's Ham Radio University is being presented in memory of its founder, Phil Lewis, N2MUN, who became a silent key earlier this year. In a recent blog, John Desmond, Echo India 7 Golf Lima, reported that, in a response to an informal query, the UK regulator Ofcom indicated to the Radio Society of Great Britain that an allocation at 40 MHz for UK radio amateurs was unlikely in the near future. In the Republic of Ireland, radio hams enjoy extensive amateur allocations in the VHF part of the spectrum. In 2018, their regulator, Comreg, granted amateurs access to almost all of the spectrum between 30 and 70.5 MHz. But unfortunately, other national regulators have yet to follow Comreg's good example. In EI7GL's blog, John quotes the RSGB VHF manager, John Reno, who said that, whilst Ofcom would agree to the continuation of the GB3 Romeo Alpha Lima propagation beacon on 40 MHz, they would not agree to further beacons or general access to 40 MHz by UK amateurs. Notice of variation access to unused spectrum at 71 and 146 MHz was granted for innovative experimentation and not more of the same CW, single sideband and FM. The view expressed by Ofcom is that UK radio amateurs have adequate VHF and UHF spectrum for these traditional activities. The GB3 RAL 40 MHz beacon first went on air back in 2007 and it was only operational for a short period. The RSGB are now looking to find a new home for this 8-metre beacon and getting it operational again. You can find EI7GL's blog at echoindia7golflima.blogspot.com. 
By the time the Hammerland Radio Hullabaloo Special Event Station W4H went off the air, the 11 operators from the High Appalachian Mountain Amateur Radio Society had logged 975 contacts across 49 states, 11 provinces, and 30 foreign countries. The three-day event between the 19th and 21st of November was a celebration of the November 19th birthday of company founder Oscar Hammerland in 1861. The operation also gave a respectful nod to the presence of Hammerland's radio factory right there in Mars Hill, North Carolina, between 1951 and 1973. Mostly, however, the special event was a celebration of the famous Hammerland radios, some of which were pressed into service to make contacts during this successful special event. According to Ralph W4RRJ, one operator was even using a Hammerland SP600JX17 receiver and a Johnson Viking 2 when he made his contacts using AM mode. This wasn't the only vintage equipment. Ralph said that about one-third of the single sideband contacts were made by operators using a Collins KWM2. Ralph went on to say that the most common stories operators heard were from hams who regretted having sold their old Hammerland radios years ago when they drifted away from amateur radio, not knowing they'd return someday. Another ham recalled growing up near the Mars Hill factory and remembering the silver dollars the company gave employees on the business's 10th anniversary. The special event also called for contacts on the Mount Mitchell 2-meter repeater, the highest repeater east of the Mississippi River, so that hams unable to get on HF could still check in. Rouse said next year's plans are even bigger. It will be the 140th anniversary of Hammerlin's birthday and the 70th anniversary of the factory's move to Mars Hill. A group of science students in Pella, Iowa, feel like they've been around the world, and in a way, they have. It took 13 days, 2 hours, and 8 minutes for the 155th graders from the Jefferson Intermediate School to complete the journey on November 18th that involved crossings over the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, the Yellow Sea, and the Pacific Ocean. The students stayed home, of course, but their hearts and minds traveled with a helium-filled scientific balloon they'd launched with support from the Pella Amateur Radio Club. It was launched carrying a sky tracker with APRS that had been designed and built by Bill Brown, WB8ELK. The near space balloon transmitted on two meters as it carried the call sign WB0URW-8 around the world as the students kept tabs on it on their computers and smartphones. Jim Emmert, WB0URW said that with financing from local foundations, the Pella Club has been working with students at the school for a while now, presenting various lessons in the fields of earth science and amateur radio technology. The balloon, the latest such venture, was a success. Not one to rest on its helium-filled laurels, the balloon returned home, according to Jim, only to embark on its second such journey. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. Coming up next, which TV should I buy? And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This week in amateur radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. This gives me an excuse to kind of explain all of this alphabet soup that's around modern TVs. I'll start off by saying... There really are two technologies you should be aware of for LCD or big screen flat panel displays. There's LCD, and that is even if it says QLED or LED, it's still an LCD. The way LCDs work, liquid crystal displays work, is kind of like a shutter. The liquid crystal is actually a shutter that opens and closes very rapidly. Behind it, there is a backlight, and the backlight is white. It is as pure a white light as they can get, uh, and there are a variety of ways of generating that. In the old days, it used to be fluorescent. Now, it's almost always LED, hence the LED in the name. But it's still a liquid crystal display with shuttering, and of course, it does red, green, and blue, and it changes those appropriately to give you, give you the right colors. So most of the time, when you're talking about different technologies with LCD TVs, you're really talking about the backlight, and there are varieties of ways of doing this. Uh, Scott Wilkinson will talk about something called FALD, which is full array local dimming. That is basically 
when we had uh, fluorescent tubes, you would have a few fluorescent tubes, and you might have noticed some hot spots, some brighter spots. It wasn't even. With full array local dimming, you have a full array of LEDs. They're cheaper than fluorescents. They're also more reliable behind the liquid crystal shutters so that there is an even amount of light on almost every pixel. That's important. And local dimming is great because it means instead of just opening and closing the shutter to a certain degree to make it brighter or darker, you can even turn the backlight in, an, in a local area down or off, which gives you a broader dynamic range, darker blacks, brighter whites. That's always something that's been a problem on LCDs. LCDs are very bright. They're great for brightly lit rooms. They're also the least expensive technology out there. But they've always had an issue uh, compared to the older plasma technology and the newer OLED technology. They just didn't have the, the dynamic range, the, the high dynamic range of darkest darks and brightest brights because this backlight couldn't be dimmed. So FALD, full array local dimming, is the most recent technology to help you get a broader dynamic range of lighting on your TV. And that really helps. The most important thing, frankly, if you ask me, among all the specs, we talk about UHD or 4K. That's the number of dots on the screen. We also talk about HDR. That is the most important spec, high dynamic range range because the broader the dynamic range the more like real world lighting it looks like even today tvs photography very few things can cover the full array of brightness and darkness that your eyes can but the closer they come the more natural the more realistic it'll look and nowadays since many movies are shot in hdr many sources are hdr it really does make a difference in the quality. I think more than the resolution, especially with a big screen like that, you're going to be sitting at a, dist a little bit of a distance, 10 feet probably or, or more from the TV. The number of pixels per inch is less important than the HDR. So HDR is good, and I would recommend it. I should mention that if you're, and you're looking at these 4K TVs, you will not get the benefit of a 4K TV or HDR unless your input sources support 4K HDR as well. This is something that happens to people when they buy these new TVs, you know, 500 bucks, great deal. And then they realize, but I'm not getting 4K pictures because you're using an old cable box or an old Roku or an old Apple TV. You will be upgrading if you want to get that full benefit of those beautiful TVs. The sources, your cable box can go to 4K, call your cable company. There are 4K Rokus, the Roku Ultra, Apple TV comes in 4K as well. If you use an AV receiver, it will also have to be 4K. So if you're pumping your Apple TV into a receiver and then into your TV, you're going to have to upgrade the receiver as well. I ended up buying everything new in order to support my TV. Now, the best pictures in 4K are actually not LCD. I think they've made some great progress. QLED is, is really good. Fall, full array local dimming, as I mentioned, is really good. But the best picture in uh, flat screen TVs these days is OLED. Uh, they don't make plasmas anymore. OLED's the best. It is more expensive. Problem is you can't tell at the Costco because they're set on the demo mode, which is a very bright, colors are extra vivid to make you go, ooh, that looks good. That's not what you want. When you get it home, you're going to turn that off, put it in cinema mode. The colors will be more muted. The light will be not quite as bright. It'll be more natural. When your eyes get used to that, it's actually preferable. It's a much more accurate picture, but that's never what they show in the store. So it's very hard to, to judge side-by-side -side TVs. There's one more thing to consider in both of these, and that's the software. Smart TVs. That means you can run Netflix, YouTube. You might even be able to run a browser in them. I caution you against using that as a way to choose TVs. Because in most cases, smart TVs, the software is not as good as the same software running on a Roku or an Apple TV. They're not kept as up to date. It's not unusual, for instance, I have Samsung TVs that the browsers are no longer useful because they've expired and they haven't been keeping them up to date. You'll also find with Samsung anyway, uh, they put ads in the smart TV interface. I'm not a big fan of that. I don't want to see ads for Samsung products. In some cases, you can turn that off. But I would, if, if you think you're going to use the smart TV features, I would look at them and make sure, A, that the usability is good. I think Samsung and LG both are, are fairly good in that regard. 
but you might want to try it to make sure you agree. You like the remote. Uh, I think, again, that's more a matter of personal taste than actual technical differences. I think they're both pretty good. And I would take a look at the, interf the, the interface for the smart TV if they're showing you ads. You should also read, I know this is a lot of work, but you might want to also read the privacy statement. One of the reasons I'm not a fan of smart TVs in general is they very often, in fact, I would say almost universally, certainly with Samsung, and I bet with LG too, uh, watch what you're watching and send that information back to marketers for advertising and ratings purposes. You may not want that. What I generally do with smart TVs, I don't connect them to the internet. I, w I don't want the smart features and I really don't want the privacy invasion. When you don't connect a TV like that to the internet, it can't do that. It can't watch what you're watching. It can't put ads on the screen, it, but you won't be able to use the smart TV features. So that's another reason to recommend getting a good Roku Ultra or an Apple TV 4K, plugging that into the TV and using that uh, instead of using the uh, Samsung or LG smart TV features. It is a good idea to check to see if you're getting the latest model. It's going to be a little tricky because when they sell in big box stores, a lot of companies and both Samsung and LG are doing this use model numbers that don't match what they use when they sell in other places. So you can't compare models. Often the models sewn in the big box, sold in the big box stores are older. They're last year's TV. And normally with both LG and Samsung, that model number would tell you what year it is, but they've changed these so that you can't, you can't tell. You might do a Google search on UN7300 or TU700D to see what model year that is. Not the worst thing in the world. That's one of the reasons they're very affordable. If it's last year's model, there haven't been big leaps forward in technology. It's just something to be aware of. 65 inches is a good size. Uh, it really does depend on how close you are to the TV. 65 inches is okay for 10 feet. But if you're going to be 15 feet or more behind, you're going to want to get a bigger TV because ideally, this TV is almost a cinema-like experience. Ideally, you want it to you know, cover 45, 50 degrees uh, of view. It's not going to be 90 degrees, but you don't want to be looking left and right. It's not like you're sitting in the front row of the movie theater. But you want enough so that you know, your peripheral vision is actually seeing something. So that's about 50 degrees, something like that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's 90 degrees. So you, you want to be fairly close to it. There are online guides to viewing angle and distance and the appropriate size. 65 is pretty big, but there's some things to think about uh, in terms of the technologies. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Amateurs entered the summer of 1912 with a new radio act in place. Thanks to the Titanic disaster and the fear that commercial interests would try to monopolize the radio spectrum, the government stepped in and set up a licensing structure administered by the Secretary of Commerce. In the new law, amateurs, actually private stations, were limited to a wavelength of 200 meters and a maximum power of 1 kilowatt. Since the no usable spectrum at that time ran from about 300 to 3,000 meters, or 1,000 kilocycles to 100 kilocycles, it was widely believed that amateur radio would fade away without expensive government enforcement. At first, it appeared the bureaucrats were correct. Before the Radio Act, there were an estimated 10,000 stations. Now, there were only 1,200 licenses issued by the end of 1912. Amateurs were finding it difficult to get their spark stations going on 200 meters, and when they did, they discovered their maximum range was 25 to 50 miles instead of the 250 to 500 mile range they had on the longer wavelengths. Amateur radio was slowly heading for oblivion. The big stumbling block to effective communications on 200 meters, or indeed any wavelength, was the spark transmitter and unamplified detector, both of which were extremely inefficient. 
On the transmitting end, no method other than Spark was known. As for the receiver, there had been two developments in the vacuum tube area. J.A. Fleming had developed the diode detector in 1904. It cost a lot of money, provided no amplification, and used expensive batteries. It was not practical at the time, but it was covered by a patent. In 1906, Lee DeForest took Fleming's valve, added a third element called a grid, and named the result the audion. In the right circuit, the audion could amplify by a factor of five. Still, because of the cost, battery requirement, and the ever-popular patent fights of the time, it went unnoticed and unused until 1912, when a 22-year-old amateur made an important discovery. Edwin H. Armstrong was an experimenter and almost militant individualist. He had obtained an audion for use in his station. Dissatisfied with the poor amplification, he tried different circuits. At one point, he fed back a portion of the output back into the input to be re-amplified. Instead of just a five times amplification, the output was now 100 times stronger than the input. He also discovered that if too much feedback was used, the two began to oscillate. This regenerative circuit was the most important discovery in radio in years. One tube could amplify more than 100 times. Two tubes in series could give a gain of 2,000 plus. In addition, an alternative to spark was now available. Instead of a raspy, broad, inefficient signal that took up hundreds of kilocycles, the audion could be made to oscillate a stable, pure signal on one frequency. In fact, that's where the phrase CW comes from. A continuous wave on one frequency rather than a broad, intermittent wave on many. Although it would take more than 10 years to develop the stability in transmitters and receivers to fully utilize CW, King Spark was doomed. Realizing the importance of his regenerative design in both transmitting and receiving, but lacking the money to develop it, in January 1913, Armstrong had the diagrams of his circuit notarized. This was only the first of many spectacular inventions Armstrong would come up with. Within 10 years, he would also develop the Super Heterodyne, now used in all receivers, and the Super Regenerative, the basis of all VHF and UHF receivers from the 20s through the 50s, and still used today in children's walkie-talkies. Even his first design, the Regenerative Circuit, is used by Tentec and MFJ in their receiver kits. The crowning achievement in Armstrong's career came in the 1930s when he developed frequency modulation. With all due respect for those who flocked to Loomis, Tesla, or Marconi as the father of radio, my vote goes to Armstrong, for without him, wireless would be stuck at the 1912 level. Armstrong had a tempestuous life, full of public and private battles, advancements, setbacks, and lawsuits before his tragic death in 1954. The final legal battles did not end until 1967. Meanwhile, back in 1913, word of the regenerative circuit spread quickly throughout the amateur world. Experimenters who added the audion to their receivers discovered that distances of up to 350 miles were now possible on two meters. The audion, already scarce and expensive, became even more so under the laws of supply and demand. The search for an audion to the amateur was like the quest for the Holy Grail. In fact, it was this search which led to the second pivotal event in amateur radio history. Hiram Percy Maxim was a 44-year-old engineer and inventor who had a one kilowatt amateur station in Hartford, Connecticut. He wanted an audion for his receiver and was unable to locate one. Finally, he heard of an amateur in Springfield, Massachusetts who had one for sale. Hartford was, and still is, only 30 miles from Springfield, yet Maxim stations could not cover the distance. He found a station midway between the two cities that was willing to relay his purchase offer. Maxson thought about this and eventually realized that a national organization was needed to coordinate and standardize message relay procedures as well as act as a national lobby for amateur radio interests. On April 6, 1914, Maxson proposed the formation of the American Radio Relay League. With the backing of the Radio Club of Hartford, who appropriated $50 and some volunteers, Maxim developed an application form explaining the purpose of the ARRL and inviting membership. These were sent out to every known major station in the country. 
Maxim, like Armstrong, was a prolific inventor. Unlike Armstrong, however, Maxim was also an expert in publicity and public relations. By July, national magazines such as Popular Mechanics were writing favorable reports about the ARRL. Maxim also traveled to Washington, D.C. to explain the ARRL to the Department of Commerce and the Commissioner of Navigation. The PR blitz paid off. By September 1914, there were 237 relay stations appointed and traffic routes were established from Maine to Minneapolis and Seattle to Idaho. Realizing that long distances on 200 meters were not possible at that time, even with a regenerative receiver, Maxim got the Department of Commerce to authorize special operations on 425 meters or 706 kilocycles for relay stations in remote areas. Boosted by the publicity, the number of amateur stations, as well as the relay stations in the ARRL continued to grow. By 1916, there were 6,000 amateur licenses, of which 1,000 were ARRL relay stations, and there were 150,000 receivers in use. The emphasis in the ARRL was on the word relay. ARRL stations were expected to handle traffic on the six main trunk lines, three north-south and three east-west, that served more than 150 cities, and there was traffic. The general population, to whom phones were a luxury, long distance an exotic concept, and telegrams expensive, flocked to the idea of coast-to-coast -coast free messages. As a PR exercise to test the system nationwide, on Washington's birthday 1916, a test message was sent to the governors of every state and President Wilson in Washington, D.C. The message was delivered to 34 states and the president within 60 minutes. By 1917, the system was so refined that a message sent from New York to California took only 45 minutes. To deal with the increasing number of relay stations, the ARRL started a little magazine, which they called QST. Other amateur activities in this period brought favorable publicity to the hobby. In March 1913, a severe windstorm had knocked out power, telegraph, and telephone lines in the Midwest. Battery-powered amateur stations handled routine and emergency traffic until regular service was restored. This was the first documented emergency communications in amateur radio history. In 1915, amateur station 2MN determined that the powerful Telefunken station at Sayville, Long Island was sending information concerning Allied and neutral shipping to submarines at sea. Thanks to the work of this amateur, the government took over the station. However, the war in Europe was getting closer. In April 1917, based on continued violations of our neutrality and unrestricted submarine activity, Congress declared war against Germany. With the U.S. now in World War I, a message went out from the Secretary of Commerce to all private stations. By order of the Chief Radio Inspector, all transmitting and receiving stations were to be closed and disassembled, and all antennas taken down. Complete radio silence was to remain until the war ended and the order was revoked. Amateurs by the thousands packed away their stations and marched off to war. The 200-meter ban was silent. In September 1917, with no radioactivity permitted and 80% of the amateurs at war, QST ceased publication. Would amateur radio survive the war? Stay with us next time as we wait for Johnny to come marching home again. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Here's the AMSAT report. It was 20 years ago, on November 13, 2000, that the International Space Station Expedition 1 crew turned on the amateur radio on the International Space Station radio for the first time and completed several contacts with ground stations and a school around the world. Today, two radios are aboard the ISS, a Kenwood TMD-710GA in the Columbus module and a Kenwood D-710E in the Zvezda service module. Here we are in 2020 with new radios on station, plus a specially designed power supply. Many ham astronauts have used the gear during their stays on station. Some made a lot of contacts outside of the ARIS schedules, and a few even took part in field day.
It's still possible to snag a random contact on 145.8 with an astronaut if you're lucky. Thanks to those who made communication with space travelers possible, including ARIS, of course, NASA, AMSAT, ARRL, and the Russian Space Agency. The list is too long to name all of those who set the ARIS program in motion and have kept it going over the past two decades. Thanks to Bruce Page, KK5DO, for this report. Some interesting information now from the AMSAT Bulletin Board. The Thailand Amateur Radio Satellite Group, AMSAT HS, has requested permission from the MBTC, Thailand's regulator, to establish a temporary portable station in Chiang Mai and Mae Hong Son provinces in the north of Thailand. This is in Grid Square, November Kilo 99. The plan is to communicate via all of the LEO and MEO amateur radio satellites, which includes QO100 narrowband, that will pass over Thailand during the operating period, the 26th, the 27th and the 28th of November. They will be using the call sign Hotel Sierra Zero Alpha Juliet Portable on behalf of the Radio Amateur Society of Thailand under the royal patronage of His Majesty the King. The Society would like to notify this activity to all radio amateurs who might be interested in contacting stations in Thailand on its northern border. Even if the angle is as low as zero degrees, they ask hams to try to make contact and they hope to meet you on the satellites. The station will be operated by Cobb, Echo 21 Echo Juliet Charlie and Tanan, Hotel Sierra 1 Juliet Alpha November. And you can find out more about the QO100 satellite by going to amsat-uk.org. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Friday, November 27th, 2020. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that over the past week, our sun has been quite active with rising sunspot numbers and solar flux, showing strong evidence that solar cycle 25 is progressing. Average daily sunspot numbers rose from 12 last week to 27.9 in the current week, while solar flux rose to a high of 103.7, bringing the average daily solar flux up from 79.8 to 90.1. The average daily planetary A index rose from 3.1 to 9.9, and average daily middle latitude A indices went from 2.1 to 7.7. The predicted solar flux is 106, 108, and 105 on November 27th to the 29th and 102 on November 30th to December 4th. 92, 89, and 85 on December 5th through the 7th. 82, 80, and 78 on December 8th through the 10th. 75 on December 11th through the 17th. 77, 80, 90, and 92 on December 18th through the 21st. 94 on December 22nd through the 25th, and 92 on December 26th all the way through January 1st. And now, with more on recent sunspot activity, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report from the Southgate Amateur Radio News. A new sunspot, several times wider than the Earth, rotated over the sun's eastern limb on Tuesday. This brings the sunspot count to its highest level in years, and more sunspots appear to be in the offing. Solar Cycle 25 is clearly gaining steam. Spaceweather.com said that this new sunspot, designated AR2786, is so big it could swallow the Earth with barely a ripple. The dimensions of the spot make it an easy target for safely filtered backyard telescopes. The sunspot is turning towards Earth and could soon become a source of geoeffective flares. By the way, for a fee, you can subscribe to Solar Flare Alerts at spaceweather.com. Just go to the website and follow the link. The previous sunspot, AR2785, erupted during the late hours of November the 23rd, producing a C4-class solar flare. The explosion hurled a plume of plasma more than 250,000 kilometres across the sun and a pulse of ultraviolet radiation from the flare hit Earth, briefly ionizing the top of our atmosphere. This, in turn, caused a shortwave radio blackout over the South Pacific, including Eastern Australia and all of New Zealand. Frequencies affected were mainly below 10 MHz. 
Spaceweather.com said that more solar flares are likely. Three of the biggest sunspots of young solar cycle 25 are either facing Earth or turning in our direction. They all pose a threat for C-class flares with a slight chance of even stronger M flares. Foundations of Amateur Radio the other day, during a radio play date, highly recommended activity, getting together with friends, playing radio, seeing what you can learn, we were set up in a park to do some testing. The idea was an extension on something that I've spoken about previously, using Whisper, weak signal propagation reporter, to test the capabilities of your station. If you're not familiar with Whisper, it's a tool that uses your radio to receive digital signals from Whisper beacons across the radio spectrum. Your station receives a signal, decodes it, and then reports what it heard to a central database. The same software can also be used to turn your station into a beacon, but in our case all we wanted was to receive. If you leave the software running for a while, you can hear stations across many bands all over the globe. You'll be able to learn what signal levels you can hear, in which direction, and determine if there are any directions or bands that you can receive better than any other. We set up this tool in a park, using a laptop, a wire antenna, and a radio running off a battery. In and of itself, this is not particularly remarkable. It's something that has been done on a regular basis all over the globe, and it's something that I've been doing on and off for a few years. What made this adventure different is that we were set up portable about a kilometre up the road from the shack, whilst leaving the main whisper receiver running, with a permanent antenna. This gave us two parallel streams of data from two receivers under our control, using different antennas in slightly different conditions within the same grid square, for the purpose of directly comparing the data between the two. Over a couple of hours of data gathering, we decoded 186 digital signals, pretty much evenly split between the two receivers. More importantly, the stations we heard were the same stations at the same time, which gave us the ability to compare the two decoded signals to each other. One of the aspects of using Whisper is that it decodes the information sent by a beacon. That information contains the transmitter power, the grid locator and the call sign. After the signal is decoded, the software calculates what the signal to noise ratio was of the information and records that additionally giving you a distance and direction for each beacon for that particular transmission. I created a chart that showed what the difference was between the two, plotted against the direction in which we heard the decode. That means that you can compare which antenna can hear what in which direction in direct comparison against the other. In telling this story, another friend pointed out that the same technique could be used to compare a horizontal versus a vertical antenna, even compare multiple bands at the same time. It looks like I might have to go and get myself a few more RTL SDR dongles to do some more testing. If you don't have a spare device, there's also the option of comparing other whisper stations that share a local grid square, so you can see what other people near you can hear, and if you like, use it as an opportunity to investigate what antenna system they're using. Whisper is a very interesting tool, and putting it to use for more than just listening to a band is something that I'd recommend you consider. I've already created a standalone Raspberry Pi project, which you can download from GitHub if you're itching to get started. Thank you to Randall, Victor Kilo 6, Whiskey Romeo, for continuing to play, and to Colin, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot India, Tango November, for expanding on an already excellent idea. If you would like to get in touch, please do. CQ at vk6flab.com is my address. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. Due to the recent stricter COVID-19 measures, many radio amateurs will be forced to spend most of the following weeks at home again. Many are obliged to telework. Teleworking is definitely becoming the new standard for several employees. COVID-19 has accelerated teleworking for almost all companies. At the request of the Royal Union of Belgian Radio Amateurs, the UBA, the Belgian regulator, the BIPT, has decided to once again grant permission for radio amateurs to apply for customised special call signs. These special call signs may be used at the home address, and the conditions are the same as during the first lockdown in spring. Exceptional conditions apply to special call signs with an encouraging suffix. 
Radio amateurs are allowed to re-request the special call sign obtained during the first lockdown. The special call signs can be requested for the period ending on the 13th of December 2020. In the event of an extension of the stricter COVID-19 measures in Belgium, the BIPT can decide to extend the validity period. As a special exception, call signs may be used at the home address of radio amateurs. This also applies to holders of Class B and C licenses in Belgium, that's Oscar November 2 and Oscar November 3. The special call signs may only be used in accordance with the licensee's own conditions regarding frequencies, transmission power and modes. The special call signs may be used simultaneously by several radio amateurs, but not by more than one radio amateur simultaneously on the same band. The costs for applying for the special call sign are being borne by the Belgian National Society, the UBA. Belgian amateurs are already activating a number of special event call signs to remind everyone of COVID-19 restrictions and to express gratefulness to medical personnel. For example, Oscar Sierra 2 Hope, Oscar Tango 5 Alive, Oscar Tango 4 Care, Oscar Romeo 2 Zero Stay Home, Oscar Tango 6 Safe, Oscar Quebec Be Clever, Oscar Romeo 6 Life, and Oscar Tango 2 Care. I wonder whether you've heard these call signs on the air. Well, this is a good time to tell you about the Ham Alert app. Ham Alert is a system that makes it possible for radio amateurs to receive notifications when a certain pre-selected radio amateur station appears on the Reverse Beacon Network or Soto Watch, the DX Cluster, or on PSK Reporter. You can sign up at hamalert.org forward slash triggers. The Ham Alert app notifies you immediately when your specified special call sign appears on the ham bands without you having to constantly keep an eye on the DX cluster. So with Ham Alert, you get the spots on your smartphone while you're busy doing other things. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. While tower climbing safety is a topic of my segment on This Week in Amateur Radio, anything we can do to reduce the amount of trips up a tower leads to increased safety because you can't fall off a tower you don't climb. Over the years, as both a professional climber and a repeater owner, I learned from personal experience how important securing coax to the tower and antenna can be. Trial and error, experimentation, and failure mode analysis have been good teachers. When installing coax on any support structure, tower, or even an antenna mast on a chimney mount, how you secure the coax to the support has a direct effect on how long it will last without failure. First, you need to know what type of coax you're installing. Some are designed to be flexible, some are more rigid. Belden 9913 is somewhat rigid feed line, 9913 Flexi and the RG8 family are somewhat flexible, meaning they are designed to be wiggled from time to time. Another issue is the movement of the center conductor as the coax heats and cools with the passage of the sun. If you use cable TV hardline, this effect can be extreme. So we examine the route we intend to take with the feed line at both ends of the support structure. This can be very important when using the more rigid or more shrink prone feed lines. At the lower end, the more rigid coax needs support. The goal of the support should be to minimize or eliminate flexing caused by mother nature. In other words, by wind or weight of snow. In one installation, we used the length of three-quarter inch conduit as the support between the tower and the ham shack to hang the coax and wires. Every installation is going to be a little bit different. Now at the top of the coax, the route from the tower to the antenna is most critical because this end tends to move more than at the bottom. If your antenna is side mounted, keep the coax attached to something like the tower's cross members or whatever else is available to add support. What you want to do is avoid any section of coax that is hanging in the wind and able to wobble in the worst of storms. Over time, this is where failures are likely to occur. I also recommend a stress loop of coax near the antenna to allow for center conductor movement, and some folks believe this tends to trap much of the energy of a lightning strike. 
When you make a few loops of coax, be sure to secure different points of the loop to the tower, mast, or sidearm so it isn't flopping in the wind either. I have found that the more rigid coax with the foil shield, when flexed repeatedly, the foil cracks, and when the wind blows, this can create a crackling interference sound in the received signal's audio. This can happen even when the coax has foil and wire braid outer conductor. So there it is in a nutshell. Support, support, support. Use flexible coax whenever possible, but avoid any unsupported runs vertically or horizontally at the top or at the bottom of the tower, mast, or whatever you're putting your antennas on. The more you secure and waterproof, the longer it'll last and the less you'll climb, which is safer. Remember to plan your antenna work around safety. Remember... Tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Get ready for some slow-scan TV from the space station next week. The International Space Station is scheduled to have an SSTV transmission on Tuesday, December 1st, starting at 1230 UTC until 1825 UTC. There will be a second transmission on Wednesday, December 2, from 11.50 UTC until 18.25 UTC. Listen for the slow scan TV signals to be downlinked at 145.800 MHz, plus or minus the Doppler shift. The mode of transmission is expected to be PD-120. You'll be able to post your images on the inline Aris SSTV gallery. For updates on this event, follow the Twitter account with the handle at symbol A-R-I-S-S underscore status. You're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio on Finer Repeater Systems Nationwide. The Osme Foundation has announced the latest recipients of the Osme Excellence Award. They are Brett Ruiz, PJ2BR, and Elena Ruiz, PJ2ZZ, Bob Wilson, and 6 tv Yari Parkyamaki, OH6BG, and Jim Brown, K9YC. The Yasme Excellence Award recognizes individuals and groups who, through their own service, creativity, effort, and dedication, have made a significant contribution to amateur radio. This may be a technical, operating, or organizational achievement. Brett and Elena Ruiz have been active leaders of the Verona Radio Club, Caracos International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, for more than 20 years. Their participation has included technical activities, disaster preparedness and relief, and training of potential radio amateurs. They serve as liaisons to government and international organizations and contribute to important events such as the Global Amateur Radio Emergency Communications Conference and IARU conferences and meetings. Brett Ruiz is also active in long-distance VHF propagation and digital communication. Yasme recognized Bob Wilson, N6TV, for his technical support to hundreds of hams through various radio manufacturers, user groups, and logging software communities, and for assistance to reverse beacon network hosts in keeping their equipment configured and running. He also provides invaluable support to traveling hams worldwide. Along with being technically talented, he is exceptionally selfless in using that talent to help others, quick to encourage others in many areas, the Yasme Foundation said in announcing the awards. Yari Perkyamaki, OH6BG, has volunteered to support the online VOACAP software and website for nearly 20 years, making world-class HF propagation prediction and modeling services available to any radio amateur. He believes in teamwork, acknowledging the contributions and ideas from the HAM community for further development of the service, but especially from James Watson, M0DNS, HZ1JW and Yuho Yoperi, OH8GLV, Yasmi said. Perkyo Maki estimates that VOA CAP Online serves thousands of users from more than 100 countries every month, including integration with the DX Summit and Club Log services. He is part of the Radio Arcala OH8X team and acts as a propagation specialist, assisting the World Radio Sport Team Championship community the Radio Society of Great Britain, and others. Jim Brown, K9YC, was cited for his extensive contribution to amateur radio regarding ferrite materials and their use in combating RF interference, feedline applications, and transformers. His efforts to improve transmitter performance and operating practices are also greatly appreciated, 
as are the extensive set of personal publications available to the public and performing reviews of technical material for amateur radio publishers, Yasmi said. The Yasmi Excellence Award is in the form of a cash grant and an individually engraved crystal globe. And finally this week, we present one man's amateur radio experience that not only inspired a career, but a long trip to the very bottom of the planet. Here is Steve Richards, G4HPE, from Southgate Vibes Amateur News with the story. In a recent article, Forbes magazine described how an amateur radio contact with the Admonson Scott Station at the South Pole spurred Jim Clash, Whiskey Alpha 3, Juliet India Delta, to travel there and operate the ham radio station. The article starts by describing a contact Jim made in the early 1970s, and it changed his life. Jim said that he was a 15-year-old in Laurel, Maryland, when he obtained his general class FCC license, which allowed him to transmit with 1,000 watts on selected frequencies. He spent many an hour on the radio between homework, sleep, and his Baltimore Sun newspaper delivery route, chatting with hams in countries all over the world, including Australia, the Seychelles Islands, Japan, and Mozambique, even the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Late one night, when Jim was on the 14 MHz frequency band, his life changed. A ham operator in Antarctica poked weakly through the static. Upon a closer listen, it was clear that not only was he in Antarctica, but at the Abenson Scott Station on the geographic South Pole. Jim's heart skipped a few beats. The South Pole, that was about as wild and remote a place as his teenage imagination could conjure up. Jim nervously called, but with no response. He called again, and this time he was heard. He had a brief contact exchanging names, locations, signal strengths and frequencies, and then agreed to swap QSL cards. When the card arrived in the mail a few weeks later, Jim was so excited that he had it framed on his bedroom wall. The experience had stoked a fire in Jim for exploration, and he later became a travel writer. And sure enough, decades later, after much hard work and planning, Jim got a rare opportunity. He joined an expedition to the South Pole, cross-country skiing the last 70 miles in minus 30 degrees weather, the team pulling 125-pound sleds behind them. Once Jim arrived at the pole, after photographs at the ceremonial pole marker were taken, he asked where the ham radio transmitter was. Well, it was in an old dome building, which was partly covered in snow and mostly abandoned in favor of more modern, newly constructed barracks. Jim made a beeline for the dome, and sure enough, there was a transmitter near the entrance in a small room. He got chills when he first saw it. This was where the ham operator sat when he answered Jim's weak signal all those years ago. Jim set the dial for the same 14 MHz frequency band he had used when he originally contacted the pole. He called CQ. The reply was hard static. He tried several more times, but to no avail. The station manager shook his head. It turned out that the ionospheric conditions in the atmosphere weren't conducive to signal propagation. These blackouts do happen in polar regions from time to time, particularly when the sun emits solar flares. Jim was disappointed, of course, but only briefly. He'd found the station's unique radio setup, and then he'd actually got to transmit from it. It would have been nice to give a ham somewhere in the world the same thrill Jim had had as a teen, the thrill which helped inspire him to become an adventure writer. But maybe when conditions were better. While I was reading an abridged version of the article there, you can find the full article with some of Jim's fantastic photographs too at www.forbes.com forward slash sites. Just follow the links to Jim Clash. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet.
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the KD5DMT 145.290 and 443.025 MHz repeater system in Centerton and Garfield, Arkansas. Owned and operated by the Benton County Radio Operators Club, serving Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri, and Northeast Oklahoma. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.